Okay. Okay. Um, I'm recording this. Uh, it looks like we've got like oh, I gotta turn the thing on. You know that classroom down there is always back. Oh, um, what's going on here? Why isn't this? The classroom down there is always always back. How many people do we have down there today? It's just me, Gillespie. So we don't have anybody here. Did everybody go to AAG today? Do what now? I said, did everybody go to AAG today? It's like, nobody's here either, up here. There's not many people. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. I know the capstone class is going tomorrow. Okay. Which is good since that's the UAS day. It works out perfectly. All right, well, it, uh, I got, I'm recording this. We probably have... I have about two thirds of the people that usually come, uh, so it'll be recorded. But um, one thing I'd like to do is go over the exam, and uh, so I'm going to pull that up and uh, talk about uh, how it was graded, and then go over the written portion of the exam because uh, that way. You know what I expected for the answers, and um, uh, it was a little bit hard to say which one you missed, so this way you'll know what you missed. Okay, so we'll go over it. So I, I just, it's 20, 20 questions, and I just basically took off one point for each question. Uh, Dr. Raver? Yeah. Can you share your projector screen? Oh, please. Sorry. Is that, is that shown up there? Yeah. Oh, okay. I shared it. I don't know what the... There it is. I did it. Okay. Thank you. All right, no problem. So, I've got the exam up here without any answers, but I'll just go over and tell you the answers. So, basically, the difference between those two statements is that... Um, I don't think this should take too long. Uh, that the first one assigns the value 6 to x, the second one asks if x is equal to 6. Um, and so it evaluates to false. Right? So for the next series of questions, um, interpret the code above the question. Some code blocks will have more than one question. Feel free to point out any errors, but you should assume that there aren't any. So there's not like a trick question. Like, okay, and I did make some errors. Try to point them out. All right, so for this one, uh, what I'm asking you is, what is the value of x when printed at the end of the program? Print x. So the value of x at the end of the program would be 3. Uh, this was just to test whether you understood that just because that value went through a function, it, did, it didn't change. So 8 is 3. Number 9, what is the value of c at the same point in the program execution? Another one to test your knowledge about uh, uh, local versus global functions. I'm just going to stand right here because this way I can point to it and people watching the video will see. So the value of C at the, if I, in other words, if I wrote print C here, I would get, I would get, uh, it, it wouldn't get anything. The value, C doesn't have a value at that point. Um, and so uh, you should put something like that. Uh, C doesn't have a value, get an error, something like that. So what's the value of answer as the program completes? So the value of answer uh, is the, and I accepted either one of these. You could actually write the number that it got, which I don't remember right now, but you could also just say it's the hypotenuse uh, in a three, four, five right triangle. That's the answer. So. So that would be the answer, five. What would the data type of answer be as the program completes? And uh, this one might have been a little bit tricky, uh, but uh, it would be a float just because the math.square root function always returns a float. What uh, is the find hypon? What is find hypon? It's a function. So that's what I was looking for there, a function. Right. Okay, so here you just had to basically write a comment, and the comment was supposed to be, it was kind of like you were reverse writing pseudocode. 
you had to write a comment about what that line did. So uh, the comment, the first line could be something like uh, import ArcPy uh, in order to have access to ArcGIS and its function. Okay. The second line uh, sets the workspace so that we can uh, write to files and read from files without having to write a full script, the full path. Uh, the, the next one uh, labels, gives names to two data sets that are in the workspace, maybe. Uh, the final one says uh, to buffer, to do a buffer on the uh, Wells data, output it to the output data, and uh, at first I was going to like uh, be kind of nitpicky about what this one meant, uh, but I didn't end up doing that. So, so the value of, of, of buff uh, would would be a field name. And the reason why you know it's a field name, it's expected that it's a field name, is because it's in quotes. Um, and uh, you know, this is an overbook text, so if you want to go back and look at what that is. So that represents the buffer distance. But I didn't end up grading that that, that hard. Um, I was pretty, uh, I, I, I had a lot, a lot of, of okay answers. I didn't have you get that detail. As long as you said something about how this was doing a buffer analysis on the Wells data, I said it was okay. Okay? All right, number 14. In the question above, how would it change things if the last line looked like this? Um, here, you had to say something about how uh, it, would, uh, it would fail unless there was a value, unless there was a file actually called Wells and a, and a feature class Actually, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need a feature class called output, but what here you're saying is that I want the actual file name to be called Wells, and this is a variable that's setting it equal to Wells data. <clears throat> All right. So, um, 15. So what's an ArcPy environment setting? So here, I wanted you to I say that an environmental setting was a setting that uh, a setting that uh, that set a parameter for how the uh, tools were going to execute. So workspace is an environmental setting. The cell size, the scratch workspace, those are all environmental settings. Okay. So you you could have you could have used any example, including the setting the workspace, uh, and gotten full credit for that one. Right. Okay, so these, this is where I made an error. My list, this should say my list. So that's, that's the only the error in there. I think most people assumed that. Worked out fine. Um, however, uh, this was probably one of the mo most missed questions here. Is function one a reduce, map, or filter function? And uh, so, and I think a lot of people just uh, kind of got. Uh, Got these, these terminologies confused. So a reduce function boils all the numbers in a list or uh, a tuple, whatever sequence, down into a single number or sometimes two numbers, but it, it summarizes them. So this is technically a reduce function. It calculates the total and the count and it returns those values. So reduce. The data type at the end of the return value with the comma there, this return value is actually a tuple. So that was, these two questions were probably the most missed questions in the done. So it's a reduced function, tuple, those are the right answers. Uh, so if, if you missed uh, one or two, those maybe were the ones you missed. Okay, 18. Yes. Yeah. 18. So in this one, um, Again, I, I, I just messed up this variable name. Uh, same thing applies. Okay, so is this function a reduce, map, or filter function? So the difference between a map and a filter function is that a map function takes all the values in an, a list and converts them to new values. One, one, one. So there's a, there's a one to one relationship. A filter function removes some of the items in a list based on a filter. Another way to think about it is it lets 
and let some items pass through and be in the output list. So this is technically a map function because it takes each item in the list and it changes the item in the list to a new value. In this case, it converts between Fahrenheit and Celsius, so you didn't need to know that, but that's what it's doing. All right, uh, so that's a map function. So why is it not necessary that function two returns a value? Even if I wanted, uh, even if I want to use the list after the function executes later in the program, the reason is that lists are always passed into functions, um, are always passed into functions so that when the list gets changed inside the function, then the list changes. Okay? It's not a copy of the list that's passed into the function, it's the actual list. All right. Um, what do functions, so they're not passed by value, another way to say that, fancy way to say that, is not passed by value, they're passed by reference, like other objects. What value do functions serve in programming? So here, um, originally uh, I was going to look for, for three exact answers, but I ended up being more liberal, and as long as you kind of had at least two of the thoughts, I, 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 I accepted it. So th the answers were, uh, one, that uh, it, uh, <clears throat> it allows us to compartmentalize code and basically organize code better. You know, you, you, could, you could certainly have a function, if you're only going to use it once, you could, you could just write it in the rest of the program. But if you write it as a function, you can compartmentalize that and write it as a, like a sub-program. So it, it helps an organization. So that was, that was one uh, of the, the three points. Uh, the second one is that it helps us write, uh, it helps us write code like faster because if there's something that's repeated often, uh, we, can, we can call that function instead of, instead of writing it in our code multiple times. It keeps us from cutting and pasting. Uh, so we can, we can reuse code uh, if we write them uh, as functions. So we've got organization, um, uh, reuse, and I forgot to bring my key. I'm trying to think of the last one that I might that I was looking for. Um, uh, yeah, that's kind of organization. But anyway, uh, I'll think of that. I'll, I'll get my key where I wrote it down. But if you had if you had either of those two or another good reason that I can't think of right now, uh, I uh, I give you full credit on there. So most most people if they missed something, uh, missed it on these function questions. That was a big uh, part, and uh, and these questions right here. What data type would X be? The, there were there were a number of, of points missed here. Uh, the the places where people did well on this question, and uh, people did fairly well on on this question. I think I graded a little bit. Uh, on these on these questions, I graded them uh, in a more loose fashion. Okay, and some people missed uh, this question. Um, all right, so that's the uh, the test. That's the written portion of the test. The other portion of the test, uh, what I what I'll what I should do is just like post uh, a working version. It's a little bit hard to say. Okay, if you got it like this, then it works, right? Um, because everybody could write it slightly differently. And so I put in your thing whether you got full credit or not. Basically, if you didn't make a toolbox, that was um, 10 points off right there. Like if you just submitted a Python um, thing without making a tool toolbox. Uh, so um, that was where most of the uh, points came back because I said it, it should be a toolbox. Uh, however, I did take off some points if the logic was was incorrect. Um, in other words, if it didn't produce exactly what it was supposed to do. Um, so there were some points taken off for that, and then there were also some points taken off uh, if uh, you didn't, uh, if, you, if your code didn't create a, or didn't ask the user for all the things that I told you to ask the user for. So the user had to be able to specify the area at the end. The user had to be able to uh, specify those distances for the buffers. Okay, but in terms of how you got to the end point, if you if you you know erased in a different order than I did, 
uh, you'll you'll you know you'll still get full credit. Um, so anyway, um, for that part, uh, if you have a question about why, I tried to be pretty detailed in the descriptions when I when I took points off for the the code. Uh, but if you have questions about uh, why you got points taken off for the code portion, uh, then let's handle that on a on a one on one. Uh, basis. Okay. All right. The the final. I, I think I've already mentioned this. Will be pretty much the same format. Uh, well, I'm actually going to give you a bit, little bit longer uh, to to do the final. Uh, so we'll talk about that next week uh, when we meet. Uh, what the the final the for, final of the format will be, when its due dates will be, and and that sort of thing. Okay. Because I am going to be gone the last week of of class. All right. To close that. Okay. So, oh, I didn't make a new assignment uh, on, on Canvas yet for this week, but uh, this week 11 here. All right. So, um, remember when we started talking about the general uh, GIS using ArcPy and GIS. We spent actually two weeks uh, talking about how to make a um, how to how to execute commands in ArcGIS, and then we practiced doing that. And that was just before the test, and the test actually tested that um, that portion of the uh, of your knowledge. And then and then just after the test. We talked about, we spent two weeks talking about how to manipulate the fine grain details. In other words, go row by row and manipulate the records. And vector, GIS, is that fine grain stuff is a little bit more complicated. You know, points and lines and polygons and points and polygons having parts and points having parts that make up uh, different features. And everything's a row in the table. When raster, the, in the raster GIS model, in contrast, we have, we have a data set, okay? So just to be clear, the, what we're doing now is transitioning. Last week we talked about how to run raster GIS commands in ArcGIS. And today um, we're going to talk about the way, and it's a little bit different, but it's the way that we access, we can, we can do more fine-grained commands with our raster data. In other words, we could change individual values in a raster data set if we wanted to. Like flip them. Like there's no way to do that in ArcGIS. Uh, uh, but, so this is the equivalent lecture. So to do that, first off, we need to talk about what raster data is. Raster data ultimately is just rows and columns of numbers, right? I mean, that's, that's it. Okay. How, is, how is raster data referenced? In other words, we do have rows and columns of numbers, but how do we put that in geographic space? You know how ArcGIS does that? Like the file format, whatever file format it is, they might store this information here, but how does, it, how does ArcGIS, when you hit add data and you add a new TIFF or a new, um, or a new raster of any format, when you add that to the screen, how does it know where to put that on the screen? That's really close. Yeah. Right. Store, so she said it stores the value for every pixel, but it actually doesn't need that information. If you think about it, it doesn't store it for every pixel. It only stores one corner. And in different file formats, it says which corner it is. So it's not the same for every file format. Okay? But it, it stores one corner of your, X, of, your, uh, of your raster. The reason that it doesn't need to store anything besides one corner is that it also stores one other piece of information, and that's the cell size. So it stores the cell size and the corner. And just like a piece of grid paper, if you, know, if you know the corner and how big the grid is, 
then you know the coordinate for every other thing. Because if the cell size is 10, and let's say the corner is, ten, is, is located at 10, 10, then you know the, the corner of the next one over is, is 10, 20. So next one over this way, let's say we're going the x direction, it would be 20, 10 would be the next one. And then 20, 30, 10, and 40, 10, and 50, 10 as I go in the x direction. And as I go in the y direction, I'm just going up. Okay, I'm going from, so I'd go, instead of 10, 10, I'd go 10, 20, 10, 30, 10, 40. As I go diagonal, I have to do some math, but it's just, you know, if I went diagonal, if I went diagonal up one, and go, it's, the, it's 10, 10 squared times 10 squared, add it together, take the square root. So the square root of 200. All right. Um, so that is, um, that's, a, that's a brief description of what has to happen to reference a raster data set. And the reason that that's important is that um, the way that we access the individual values in a, uh, in a raster data set is that ArcGIS just has a function that says, here is all the data. Do what you want with it. And Python actually has um, methods that we can use to manipulate the data. So what it does is, is uh, it, instead of having a bunch of objects for handling the rows and the columns and the shapes and everything, it handles it totally different, the raster side. Basically, all ArcGIS does, it says, oh, you want to play with the data? Here you go. Here's the data. Okay? It gives us a chunk of data. And that chunk of data is the rows and columns and information. And it actually strips out the, the uh, coordinate information, the, uh, the corner and the cell size. It, doesn't even, it assumes that you don't care about that information. If you, want to, if, you want to, if you want to access that information as you're manipulating the rows and columns, you have to, um, you have to do that. Okay? So that, that uh, data type that it gives to us, the data, I'm calling it, is a bunch of numbers, and they're just rows and columns of numbers. And so it gives that to us in a, in a, in a, a variable type that we haven't talked about yet, that's new. However, it's not, it's not super new in, in terms of how you can think about it. It basically gives it to us in this thing called an array, and this is an actual Python array. It's not like the arrays we were talking about last week and the week before with vector data. It gives it to us as a, um, as a, as a Python array. And you can think of a Python array a lot like a list. It's a sequence just like a list is. It's, it's mutable, just like a list is. However, and it can be accessed by indices, just like a list can. It can be sliced, just like a list. It's got a lot of com commonalities with the list. One of the big differences, though, is that all the items in a, a Python array have to be the same data type. You can't mix data types. Okay? So you can't have some uh, strings and some numbers. An array is all the same data type. So it's an array of integers, or it's an array of floats. Uh, and, and that's very similar to, uh, to our GIS raster. A raster can't have some floats and some integers. A raster is either a float or an integer, not both. Okay? So that's one of the major differences. The, the, the other differences all have to do with the speed at which uh, Python can process it. And basically, it's in, in, in the computer science world, it's, it's a block of memory that's all next to each other. And so processing on an array can be done very, very quickly relative to if it was a list where it would have to go item by item. So what it can do is it can actually, um, uh, it can do this thing that they call broadcasting. If we have two arrays that are the exact same size or they're, they're multiples of each other, we can take arrays and do math operations on them and it, they'll work really fast, okay? So if we take uh, one, one array that represents temperature um, in uh, Celsius, we could, 
convert it to Fahrenheit by just putting it into a formula. Array times 1.8, uh, whatever the, the formula is, uh, plus 32. Okay? And it would, it would just basically do the math as if that whole array was one thing in that, um, uh, in that, uh, in that function. Was was one item uh, in the uh, in the algebraic expression? Okay. Yeah, I mean, since it strips out the spatial information, that it might be actually easier to do that in RTIS. Like just to script it using uh, existing uh, functions, even spatial analyst functions. So you might want to clip the raster mm -hmm. and then um, and, and then do your operation there. Because in order to do this in in Python, the way you're describing it, you have to know the 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 index. Not just that corner, but you have to know the index of where that was mm -hmm. to, to extract it out of there. But one thing that is interesting is that, uh, that almost everything that you can do in Spatial Analyst, you could, because this actually doesn't require a Spatial Analyst license. So if there's something like, we'll, we'll practice doing a conditional statement in, in, in using Python. You could do it without having a Spatial Analyst license uh, so, I mean, I wouldn't suggest you, you know, unless you were only going to do a few things with Spatial Analyst, you wouldn't want to rewrite Spatial Analyst in Python or anything, but uh, almost all of the functions, particularly the local functions, and some of the, the focal functions, you could rewrite in RTIS, uh, in, in Python, and they would work, they would run. Uh, okay, so let's practice doing this. I've talked for a long time today. Uh, at the beginning, uh, but uh, let's uh, let's practice. So most of this is going to be today. We're mostly going to be practiced using this raster to numpy array and numpy array to raster. So the process, the workflow is usually that you have a raster. If you want to do something with it, you convert it to an numpy array. Then you do something to it, and then you convert it back to a raster. So it's usually the process. And sometimes that seems like there's probably some overhead in doing that. And you're probably right, there is some overhead in doing that. But, um, uh, but NumPy actually does the calculations a lot faster. So if you're doing a ton of calculations, and uh, it's just as easy to do it in, in NumPy uh, than in, in another thing, it'll, it'll work fast. So we'll, we'll, kind of, we'll kind of build up to that. Um, the first example that I want to do is just this... Uh, is just this first example. And I'm not even gonna follow that process. Here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna copy and paste this into RTIS, I mean into uh, Python, and, and talk about what it's doing. Um, and we're not even going to, uh, we're not even gonna use an existing raster for this example. We're just going to um, create our own raster, okay? File, new file. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so this is a, a pretty simple uh, script. I could have typed it all up, but uh, it's, it's pretty simple, so I did it before class. Um, so what's happening here is that we're importing our pi, and we also have to import this other library. It's called, it's called I've been calling it numpy. Okay, NumPy, NumPy, people say it both ways. I'm sure there's an exact pronunciation. So NumPy stands for Numerical Python. Has anybody here used MATLAB before? No? Okay. Um, MATLAB is a, is a commercial piece of software uh, that, that is often used for 
manipulating lots of numbers, groups of numbers. And the reason why I brought it up is that uh, sometimes uh, some people make the comparison between NumPy, and NumPy has a little friend called SciPy. Sci it's in for scientific Python. So, um, and we'll talk about SciPy a little next week, but both NumPy and Sci SciPy, or Sci, or S anyway, both of these programs, SICPY and NumPy, come with Python, but you usually have to install them separately, but ArcGIS goes ahead and installs them because ArcGIS uses them. So NumPy and SciPy are already installed. And uh, SciPy is just, it's like an extension of NumPy that takes it even further and allows you to do even more scientific manipulations. Uh, so for example, I teach, the other class I teach is, uh, um, is uh, a statistics class, and it has some statistical functions in it. Um, SciPy does. Okay. But today we're going to stick mostly to Dunphy. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, so what this does is this script, it, um, it creates a new array, a brand new array with, with nothing in it using this command. All right? So this is telling it from, from NumPy, use the function called random random integers. And it's just like the random function. We, have, we did use the random function in this class earlier before. But um, what this does is it says, create a bunch of numbers from 0 to 25. And I'm sorry, from 0 to 100. All the numbers are going to be from 0 to 100, and I want 25 of them. That's, that's what that's saying. In fact, we can, uh, we can look at the help. So NumPy has its own uh, help website. Um, yeah, I'll just... NumPy has its own help, web, help website. And it's actually, SciPy is the actual bigger umbrella. But, uh, so NumPy's help is all at the SciPy website. So here is the help for this uh, particular um, uh, function. So you can see that what it's looking for is a low value, a high value, and a size. And it returns 25 numbers that are between 0 and 100. That's what it does, 25 random numbers. Before I go on, uh, I should mention that uh, this, this NumPy reference basically gives you a bunch of of help on, uh, on NumPy. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time figuring out everything that NumPy can do. Um, and it's really not, I mean, you can, there's really some, there, there's some complex things that it does, like linear algebra, and, uh, you know, matrix algebra. Uh, but it also does some fairly simple things like adding a bunch of numbers together, dividing them, treating them like numbers, basically like the raster calculator does uh, for you. Okay, so, um, and it allows you to manipulate them. So going back to our uh, help here, I mean our, our, uh, our thing here. This creates a, a, a random, a bunch of random numbers. And actually, before I get too far, I'm going to stop right there and show you what's been done so far. I'm going to run this, and uh, I'll call this uh, C, SPA, nope, temp, SPA, 11, call this uh, 2018 underscore. Okay. It's going to print it if it ever runs. I don't know why it's taking so long. Did I do something mean to you? Okay, there it goes. And it looks kind of like a list. What, you know, these brackets usually mean it's a list, right? The only difference between the way this looks and the way a list would look is there's actually be commas between each of the numbers instead of just spaces. So that's your only clue that it's an array, not a list. Okay? But these are the 25 numbers it came up with. It, it came up with. There are all sorts of functions, and you can, you can search for them. You just type in numpy sort. And it'll allow you to sort the numbers. Okay? There's one called 
Um, there's one that, that allows you to filter, that we'll talk about in a few minutes. So if I wanted to filter out all of the ones that are, that are high or low. If I wanted to find out the index, okay, because an index, any of these are indexes. Just to prove that this is mutable, I could, uh, let's see if I'll do this again. Is it my array? Yeah, okay. So if I could, if I could say my, I could say my array, and I could say four equals 200. Now if I print my array, the whole thing, now the, now the one, two, zero, one, two, three, four, the fifth element, is 200. I replaced 43 with 200. So there, it's mutable just like a list. I can, I can pull out the values and change them. Okay, I can manipulate them. So what I was talking about before, if I said my array minus 10. So then it returns a new array and all the values are, are, ten, are I've taken 10 off of each value. Okay. If I wanted to do, well, I'll talk about that and we'll talk about that as we build. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back here and do this. One of the useful things that you can do is you can reshape arrays. And you have to, by default, all of the array creation functions, so this is, you can create an array of random, you can create an array of, of full of zeros, you can create an array full of ones, those are all, those are useful, creating arrays of, uh, of all zeros and all ones, because sometimes you might need to, you know, have a dummy array to add everything or, or flag everything. Anyway, so we've got randoms, we've got ones, we've got zeros. By default, they're all one-dimensional arrays. In other words, if you think of it like a list, they're ju it's just one list. What this does is it basically says, instead of one list, I want five lists with five elements each. And another way to think about that is that I've got two dimensions. So now I'm going to, I'll just go like this and say run uh, so now instead of having one dimension see this looks just like a list of lists except for it doesn't have columns but I've got I've got this that represents the list starting and then I've got one two three four five lists and I've got uh, got my family sending me stuff okay uh, I've got five lists here, and um, uh, these these enclosed things say that it's uh, the the entire thing. Okay. All right. All right. So that's creating a that's creating a new um, a new array full of random numbers. We could take this new array full of random numbers, and we could um, we could read this into ArcGIS. So we could use it to create a new raster GIS data set. And in order to show that, I've, I've written this code. Okay. So in order to create a raster GIS data set, remember our, the two things I told you you need is the corner of one location. Here, in this case, we're going to say the lower left corner. And you need the cell size. Those are the only things that you need in order for this uh, function to work. This function is built into NumPy. I mean, into ArcGIS. You can actually look at the help there. So here's the help for the NumPy array to raster. And these are the things, these are the arguments that it needs. It needs the x, y cell size. Uh, well, okay. So you can do x and y cell size, uh, but uh, they're not supported for, for most file formats anyway. But, uh, where's the, uh, there it is, there's the syntax. Okay. So you need the, the inner array, the lower left coordinate, the x cell size, and the y cell size. Uh, I don't think I specified both. Yeah, if you only specify an XL size, then it 
only uses that value. I don't know why I called that my random raster four. I think I was experimenting a lot. Okay. So now it's going to save this out in that location. It's going to save that out. It's going to use 5050 as its corner coordinate point, and the cell size is going to be 10. So when I run this, I'm going to get a new. Uh, I, I'm going to get a new file, and we'll be able to look at it in our catalog. Make this a little smaller so you can see it. Okay, so it's done. I go to our catalog, and I, I just put it in C10. I called it my random raster. What's colorful? Oh, the result. My. Too many stuff in this directory, but. C temp. Oh, maybe I have to refresh. Refresh. Oops, that's a rename. Refresh. My random raster. Okay, so it looks colorful, but. Uh, in ArcGIS, the default display type for a raster that has less than, I think it's 100 unique values, uh, is, is just to use a random color ramp. So, a unique value color ramp. So, it just picks that. I, if I brought this into ArcGIS, I could, that's for, that's for my last class here, like map, nope. I brought this into ArcGIS. Still, there we go. And it tells you it doesn't have spatial reference information. If you wanted to have a spatial reference information, you would have to run the tool called Define Projection in, that's in ArcGIS. We practice that with, with vector data, so it's not any different with vector data. Okay. You don't need to have projection information to know where the corner is. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of what I was trying to explain. Um, so down here it says unknown units. But if I measure, well, it won't let me measure the difference. Um, but if I put my cursor right here, I get a value of uh, 4, 9, which should be, it should be 5. And if I move to right here, I get an X value down here in this corner. I get an X value of 6, 6 0.05. So the, the, di the distance between the cells is consistent with what we gave it, you know, six zero. So these cells are 10 meters across, 10 meters this way, and this corner right here, this lower left corner, is in fact 50-50, uh, which is what I told it, it I wanted it to be, see in the, in the thing? 50-50. Okay. But your question is, how do I make those? Those, instead of just being 10, how do I make it be 10 meters or 10 feet or 10 yards or whatever, whatever coordinate system it should be in, right? Uh, so to do that, that's what I was explaining. You'd have to do something like, like this. So, uh, well, actually after you saved it, you'd have to run... I guess you can't search for it there. So search. Define projection. Bam. Close it up. So you'd have to run this, uh, this tool to actually define a, a projection that would give it you know, units um, and uh, tell what coordinate system it was in. Uh, so, I would need uh, something like this. I'm going to 
have to close it in ArcGIS. All right, now this other parameter that you can give it, the projection of the coordinate system, you could get that from another file. You could get that from you could get that from another data set. That's what's been done here. So if you're if you're already working in that data set with another data set, you could do that. You could get that from um, a, a, a PRJ file on, on this somewhere. Uh, so that's how you would get that information. So it's, it's much more often that you're working with data that already exists. So let's demonstrate that when when we're dealing with data that uh, uh, that exists. All right, but that's how you would do it. You just need a coordinate system there to give it. Um, for example, uh, yeah, okay. How come I already got off of it? To help. Oh, sorry, I know all that. Okay, so copy that and put that into the help. And put that into our script. Delete, delete. And then here, we would need to give it the name of a, of a shape file. Let's, uh, or a file that already has projection information. Let's go uh, see if we have anything. What projection is this data in? Properties. No, no that's fine. It's good as it's good, good as one as any. Copy. So I've got a, a shape file that already has some. Per, it already has projection information, and I'm going to use it. I'm going to close this so it doesn't overwrite it, and then run this again. Um, hopefully I don't get an error, because I did leave our catalog open. I just want to open it. Oh. See, see this error right here? I can tell this error with all this blank white space here is because the, I, it doesn't like the slashes. So if you just put an R in front of it, like I've we've talked about a lot, it'll work. And I'm, it still might fail because of the... Uh, nope. Oh. Okay, now if I go to that data set, I shouldn't be in this refresh. I go to uh, my random raster. Now if I go, see when I'm moving around, it says it's in meters. So that this number, this number down here is in meters. And so uh, I could bring this into ArcGIS now and uh, I, could, I could actually, the major distance tool would be enabled. So you can, you can do that to plop your data uh, anywhere, anywhere you want. Now I could use it just like any other raster that would require distances. I could, I could use it to find uh, distances or calculate areas because uh, that data is now inside the system. So let's bring that up. Let's uh, hit add data. Actually, I just, I'll just drag it over from Mark. Bring that over. So could, what I was saying earlier is I could change the symbology. Okay. So now I've got this, this button, and I can see that a cell really is about 10 units, in this case, meters across. 10 point, it's just because I'm not, I'm not ex I, I can't get the exact edge. Okay. But this corner right here is in fact, see 50, 50 on the side. So create a random uh, raster. Okay. 
Okay. So, um, just like a, uh, let's go back over to here. I'm going to say this as an example too here real quick. <clears throat> just like a, um, just like a list or any other sequence, we could actually iterate through every single value uh, in a array. So I'm, I'm going to put a for statement right here. Uh, for uh, i equals uh, no, getting my languages for i in range zero comma five, and then for j in range zero comma five. Actually, that'd be zero four, right? Remember, it's all starts with zero, so five values. So then I could say my array zero, uh, my array zero comma, or sorry, i comma j is equal to So now what I did was I'm just iterating through the entire array. So here's the array, the original array. I guess it is zero comma. It was zero, one, two, three, four. Should be, should be not. I guess that is five. Yeah, because it doesn't include the, the, the last element. Okay, so this was the original array. And in the second array, what I did was I, was I replaced all the uh, random values with the, the row that they were in. So I is the, the row, J is the column, row, column. So I replaced the value in the array with its, uh, with its column number. So if I refresh, I mean, well, row number. So if I refresh this, C temp refresh. So now if we look at the output, it's going to look like why does it not look 84? Because this is my array now. Anyway, it should look like that. Maybe it had a hard time writing over it. Let's, uh, let's delete it. Slash, slash, temp. There we go. I don't know why it didn't refresh the first time, but now each each row has a different uh, has a different number assigned. So I replace these numbers with these numbers and put those into the the raster. Okay, just just showing that you can manipulate the values. What I did, what I, the values I put in there are fairly useless, uh, but it is, uh, but it is just demonstrating being able to replace those values. All right. <clears throat> so that's just creating a new raster from a, num, a numpy array or a numpy array. So let's get into a few more useful examples. Um, okay. So. 
if we go back to the, cl the class, let's look at this example here. Okay. All right. <clears throat> what time is it? All right, so what this one does is this one opens up the raster that, that I just created. Okay, opens up the raster I just created. And it asks for its extent and it asks for its cell size. That's what, that's what these two lines of code do. Okay? It asks for its extent and cell size. And then um, it replaces a single value and saves it out to a new raster. So it replaces a single value in an array. So, so, so this is an example that might get done a fair bit. You might say, well, there's, there's a value or a few values, and I know the index, where they are, and I want to replace just that value. Um, that is, is what it does. So I'm going to copy and paste this into uh, ArcPy because there's a few other things I want to talk about on it. The other thing that I want to talk about it is, in this script, when I converted it to a, an MV array, and when I converted it back from an MV array, I used this keyword here. NumPy, or ArcPy, always encodes Doe data as negative 9999. That's how it codes no data. There are a few exceptions when no data actually goes across the range of values you want to store. It needs to come up with a new number. Um, but that's how it codes it. So let's say you're working with a raster that has no data in it. Do lots of rasters have no data in them? Yeah, a lot of them do because no data is that All rasters are squares. So um, if we want to work with a raster that has no data, sometimes we want to make sure that we treat no data special or differently. All right, um, so here what it's doing is saying, I want my no data values explicitly to become zero in this numpy array that I create. And here what I'm doing is saying, the values that were zero, I want them to convert to no data when I put them back into the ArcGIS, when I put them back into the ArcGIS file format. This is important because what if you what if you knew you were going to do a multiplication? Like, okay, let's let's actually just uh, let's change this example to work on some of this uh, raster data. Let's change it to work on uh, some of the data that we're going to use for this lab. Okay, so I have that in C. C temp SPA lab and I forgot what week 10 and I have the climate data in there. Now you, you may have already downloaded it. If you didn't, it's on SPA. It's it's right here under week 11. It's this uh, climate data dot zip. So just before I get to that, in case some of you are downloading it, I'll show you. I'm going to delete this number four here just to show that this works. So I'm going to run this, uh, this module, and it's going to take that random raster that now isn't random. It's just rows. Uh, and uh, let's see. It's, going to, it's going to change the value of row three, column one to zero. Week 11, and I'm gonna call this example three, 2018. So, but the difference is it's gonna save it out into a new file. It's not gonna save out the old file. And the coordinates are gonna be in the same uh, coordinate system as, um, did it run? No, it's going to print the array after it runs. The coordinates are going to be in the same coordinates as my random raster. It 
it's, it's interesting that it's taking so long. And the first time I ran, that other script took long, but then subsequent times didn't take nearly as long. Maybe it didn't run. Maybe it just ran really fast. Let's see. Uh, let's see if it's already out. It's already. Well, it's, it would have printed something. Yeah. Huh. I wonder if my Python just kind of tweeted out. Yeah, it looks like Python just kind of stopped working. Uh, I don't exactly know why. I just restarted it. Um, but uh, anyway, that that's right. These this is nonsense. I'm just seeing it was getting into the, the code. But see how it replaced um, row three, so zero, one, two, three, column one, and replaced that value with a zero. And now it's going to save that out into this my random rasters five. I got to refresh this. I should stop saving into C temp because I got tons of stuff in C temp. I've always had a bad, um, bad habit of making fairly. Uh, crazy, lots of file names. So, Dr. Rager, yeah. It looks like uh, Dumpy counts the array row starting from one. Is that right? Instead of counting from zero? Because it actually changed the fourth row second element. Right, right, right. It's It's always zero based. Lists are zero based, arrays are zero based. Well, we said three comma one. Right, so three is really the fourth element. Because zero would be the first one, one would be the second one, two would be the third one, and three would be the fourth one. I said third row, but it's the it's really the fourth row. What's that? Right, row three is the third row. That's a, that's a good way to say it. So really one is the second row. Right, 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 right. Sorry. Oh, yeah, no problem. No, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think about that, that stuff all the time. So this, this my random raster, you can see now that these, all these values in the first row are no data, and this value is no data. It's not zero, and that's because of this other uh, thing that I did there, where I, I said that explicitly the zero values are going to be no data. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so let's get to a more practical example. Let's convert uh, all the values uh, in a, a data set from um, temperature data set uh, from numbers from one class of temperatures to another. Okay. So we've got this data set uh, that I had you download. Uh, where do I put it now? <laughs> so all the all this uh, mess actually reminds me. I was an intern at ESRI uh, for a summer, right between when I was an undergraduate and a graduate. So it's in C temp. 
and, um, and then SPA. And then the next summer when I, was a, when I was at graduate school, I mean, the next year when I was at graduate school, I noticed this poster on a wall. And I actually worked for the technical marketing department. So there was this poster on the wall, and uh, they had a screenshot. Like, it was just a bunch of things from RGIS. They had a screenshot of one of my uh, art catalogs. It was an art catalog. It was one of the ones that I created. And I, I actually had a folder called George, and, and it showed up on this actual poster of marketing material. And uh, so people were forced to believe me when I said I made it. I made that. The horrible directory structure was my fault. OK, so we're going to look at climate data. And we're going to look at temperature. So all these, th these are temperatures, monthly temperature values. I think I've used this in other classes before. But, so this is uh, March. So this is not zero based. These are actual, uh, these numbers, three represents March, one represents January, like you expect. So this is, this is temp three, and these are all the temperature values for the United States. And let's, let's, let's like press a button uh, and find out what units they're in or, or guess about what units they're in. Okay, so we have clicked somewhere in Mississippi, and I get a value of uh, 21.56. Okay, does that sound like a temperature scale that we're all familiar with? Well, Celsius, kind of, right? 21.56. That's pretty hot in the Celsius scale last time I checked, right? 2,156. Yeah. Even 21 is pretty warm, right? What's 21 in, in Fahrenheit? Yeah, I mean, it March, our, so our, our average March temperature, I'm clicking somewhere around Mississippi, uh, these are the daytime, the average daytime high, in other words, that. The average daytime high temperature in March is about what, 70 something? Well, let's, let's come up with the exact formula here. Uh, Celsius to, I wonder if that was my search before, not spelling Fahrenheit right. Okay. Uh, so one degree Celsius is 33.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so 70, I mean, sorry, oh, we need to go the other way. Yeah. 21, well, roughly 21, is 69. Okay, so for March, for March temperatures, the average daytime high, 69.8 there. All right, so um, that sounds about right. But this number is actually uh, 21, 2156. So it's actually uh, 21.56 is the way that you, you should read that. So those are, these are in Celsius times a uh, 100. And the reason that they do this a lot in raster data, you'll see this a lot in distributed raster data sets, is that if you think about how much uh, space is needed to store an integer value, particularly when you get to thousands of values, when you store a thousand integer values, it takes less space than to store a thousand floating point numbers. And so lots of times, in order to distribute data like this, they'll, they'll correct it. And then when it's actually used in display, like if you put this on a website, you could do the conversion where you just divide everything by 100 at the, at the last minute. So in any case, we're going to convert this into Fahrenheit, but we're going to leave the number as a, as, as a integer. Okay. So we'll do the same thing, but with Fahrenheit numbers. So it'll be it'll be seven something, you know, seven. Uh, 70 something or 69 something right there. Okay? All right, so let's see how we would compute this. So, to go back to here, um, the first thing that we need to do is grab our March temperatures and put that right here. So now we've got the path to our March temperatures. And by the way, I'm going to resave this as example four. So now we've got our, our, our March temperature values. And it's still useful to do this thing because what we want to do is run this through and then store out the March temperature and Fahrenheit uh, values out. But we want them to have the exact same extent uh, and the exact same cell size so that they'll overlay correctly. 
Um, I'm going to put this in the same place. Actually, I'm going to get the whole thing here. Control C, Control V, except for I'm going to call this underscore F for Fahrenheit. Actually, in order to uh, not mess up the data set for later, it'll, it'll, make, it'll make it easier. I'm going to put F at the beginning. Uh, that way, when we get to the lab portion of, the, of, the te uh, of today, that'll make it look slightly easier. Because when we search for things that start with temp, th that won't get thrown in there. Okay, so Fahrenheit temp. Now I need to put the logic in the middle. And this will kind of drive home the point that we can treat an array as if it's a single number. So what's the, what's the conversion factor that we need to do? Well, it's a, I don't know what it is off the top of my head. Uh, okay, it's 9 over 5 times the Celsius plus 32. So it's, it's, it's that number that we had from the test. Okay. So Fahrenheit is going to be my new array. So I'm going to say array is equal to array. I could create a new array, but... I don't really need to store the new array in a new data set. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to store it in the same data set. It'll, it'll make so there's less, mem less memory on the, the thing. So I've got 9 divided by 5 plus 32. I'm going to comment these out for a second. Oh, wait. I'm not going to do that. I was going to try to, well, we'll see. Interestingly, when we print this array, how big is this array? How big is this array? It's huge, right? Let's see. It's uh, 1,251 uh, columns by 654 rows. It's pretty big. So when we print this, by default, let's just run, I'll just run it. It'll take a few seconds. Um, it might even fail, but um, it will get to the print statement. So when we print this array, by de default, it's only going to print the first few lines and the last few lines. Oh. I always forget that in math, you have to, like, actually... So in math, you would just write, you know... The times... For some reason, multiplication is understood when you put two variables next to each other, but uh, not in not in Python. Okay, so need to explicitly multiply them together. Okay, um, so see how it just it just got rid of all. I mean, it just got rid of everything. It's just eating these dot dot dot. So this is the upper left. This is the upper right. This is the lower right, and this is the lower left. And these dot dot dots represent that there's a ton of values in between. And all these values are 32. Anybody know why all those values are 32? They were zeros, exactly. So um, when they were zeros, and when they went into this formula, what happened? Well, they got values of um, they got values 9 divided by 5 times 0 is 0. And we added 32, and we got 32. So that's why they're all 32s. Now, is it possible that any other value besides 32 could work out to be 0? I mean, could work out to be 32. Any other value besides 0 could work out to be 32. Okay. So... Um, one thing we could do is, is actually change our script so that this value was 32, right? By the way, let's look at the, the value. Let's look at what, what we've created. Okay, let's look at what we've created. So if I refresh this and find F3, that's what I've created. You notice that all the values out here that were zeros, why, why do they show up? Why do they not know data? They're 32 now. Because they're not zero, they're, um, 
they're not, because they're not zero, they show up as uh, not no data. It's hard to say not no data. Okay. So it does say what the no data value is here. Let's, the no data value, oh, we, can, we can't, we don't have a no data value. I wonder if we just edited it and wrote in 32, if that would work. Cool, that works too, but, um, okay. What happens if we had a value that was, the, what, there's, there's another problem that I'm trying to also point out here. Is zero a possible value, especially for a March temperature? Yes, it is. Now, I don't know if it happened anywhere in the United States that zero was a, was a uh, well, anywhere in the, the, the lower 48, but it is a possible value. In order to get around that, what we should probably do is explicitly change this value right here to something different that's not zero. Like, if we change this to negative 1,000, okay, there's no, there's no temperatures there. In fact, that's not even on the Celsius scale. There's no possible. The, the, the lowest temperature is much lower than negative 1,000. Okay. So if we change that to negative 1,000, i got to click off of it so it won't. If we change that to negative 1,000, we're still going to get a weird number. It's going to be negative 1,000 times 9 fifths plus 32. We're going to get that number to be no data. That number should be our no data. Let's see what it is. It's going to take a few seconds. So negative 9, 6, 8. Well, one thing that we could do is then change this value right here to negative 9, 6, 8. So now what we've done is when we got the stuff from ArcGIS, we converted all the areas that were no data. Instead of converting them to zero, we converted them to negative 1,000. Why did we do that? Why convert them, not convert them to zero? Because zero is a, is a number that's possible in our data set. It, it can be used. If negative 1,000 was possible in our data set, we shouldn't use negative 1,000. So you want to use, you want to pick for your no data value a value that actually makes sense. Okay? Because that's what you're going to get. You're going to get a bunch of those values. And you want to be able to filter them out. So uh, the next thing is we did our formula conversion. And after our formula conversion, there's only one possible value that could get negative 968. And that was something that was no data before. So then we feed that in, and it becomes our no data value. So that when we run it, in the output data set, it will be coded no data. And so it actually shows up as no data. So let's see if it ran. So it ran, okay, and then uh, we can look at our, our data set now. And now all these values out here are no data. And these values in here, let's click back in Mississippi somewhere, these values here are Are, are not any different. Why are, what did I do wrong? See how those values are the same? 20.99 Array Lower left Did I not? Well, I hit refresh Oops, I didn't mean to open that. I meant to open up our catalog Ow Okay, now it's in. That's the one in between.
That's the 32. Is this the same directory? Uh, it's great when it doesn't produce uh, the values you expect. I'm going to try running it again and see if it uh, Because those negative 968 values should definitely be no data now, like they were, but the values in the middle didn't look right. It's still running, right? Looks to be still running. Did it, did it die again? Oh, maybe because I'm on it? not working. Let me try to click off of it and run it again. Well, that's running. Um, let's do raster to, I mean, numpy array to raster. One of the things that uh, no data cell size that's all it's all correct. Okay, so that's it's almost done now because it's printed that array and it should be reading it writing it back into the file. Did I just never wait for it to actually finish before? It doesn't look like I did. No, well, I think you did it right. I, I get the same thing when the pixel values are still 2,000 something. Instead of, yeah, Okay. But see, that, that didn't actually finish. It just restarted. See, that finished. For some reason, this isn't even finishing. Is it doing the same thing for you guys? It's getting all the way down to here, but then it just restarts the shell. Maybe it's this, because it's this is the way I was testing it. I was testing it not going to the same place. Um, let's see if it just bails out again. The other thing that uh, we can check is, is that notice that there's no um, there's no array type that's specified uh, here, okay? Uh, in the you, you're not specifying what array type it, it is. It's just it's just taking whatever array type you give it, and uh, it's it's interpreting. Python is basically fit, putting it into one of those data types. Okay, so it did get to done that time. So maybe it just doesn't. Sometimes uh, when you take a file out of a zip file, it makes it so that it's not uh, permanent. 
or makes it so that it's not readable. I don't know why it didn't give an error, but uh, f, f underscore, there it is. Those values still aren't changed though. It did finish now. Oh, you know what? I totally, uh, well, I don't know if it's going to make a difference, but I did make a mistake. So our, our array, okay, in my notes, I just remembered this. Our array, our original array, is, um, is, is, is too big. We need to actually divide that number by 100 first. So we need to divide it by 100, then convert it to the formula and it'll, it'll give us those numbers. I don't know if that made it so that this number was just too big, but I can't see uh, why. I don't, know, I don't know. That's the only difference that I can see from, from what I was doing. Let's see if we do save this into another array, if it has any, any, any better luck. Oh, gonna have to get out of this. Oh, this number's not gonna be negative nine eight 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 anymore. It's gonna be twenty two. Well, let's just see if it. Let's just see if it actually produced different numbers this time. Okay. See, oops. See colon slash temp. Refresh and F. Okay, check the values here. There's Still not updating. Okay. I I actually did not uh, didn't check when I ran this before. I didn't check that level of, of grain. So they may have been doing that when I when I ran it before. It's frustrating. I don't know why the output numbers are not um, are not changed. Um, Yours finally did change? Did you change the name of the output raster again? I am going to change this because um, now that I'm th now I'm thinking that that this. Uh, Unless this number is afloat, uh, that it won't be, it won't, it'll always evaluate, nine divided by five would always evaluate to two. But that should still have the effect, same effect. Uh, so you change the output name, I'm just gonna call this uh, March. So, I have seen that where RTS like hangs on to some some logic. Uh, so it's, sometimes it's good to. Okay, that did change it. So I'm gonna change it back to an int at the end though, because um, because I'd rather have it stored as an integer value. Fourteen, and that's something that I that I overlooked in my math before. Was that remember when you in Python when you when you divide an integer by an integer you get an integer. So we do need to explicitly state that this is nine and this is five. 
uh, point zero, uh, somewhere in there so that it'll actually evaluate to a, a real number. Should actually do that too. Okay. So now I'm gonna open up our catalog and we'll see if my mine finally uh, finally worked. C colon slash temp contents refresh. And it's called uh, F March. There we go. These are no data out here, and they are they are the Fahrenheit numbers inside. Okay, so it, that worked. I don't know why. That's something that I did not check in my testing, but uh, it does appear like we need to explicitly uh, tell it to uh, get uh, to get a new file name at some point. I wonder if now if we uh, if we put it back in here, if it would work. One more test here, four, or no, three, and I'll call this uh, F, uh, or FT for Fahrenheit. I'm not sure whether this finally did the trick or put it in a new array. Typically, I don't. I, I would. I, I wrote it that way so that I wasn't putting it in a new array, so I'd save space in memory. Uh, because when you start when you start dealing with these big chunks of memory, you can run out of memory. Uh, we're nowhere near running out of memory for this data set, uh, but uh, so it was okay. But I, I wonder if this is what did the trick. But. Um, when we did that, it, did, it didn't take until we also changed the name. I'm pretty sure that's, that's what the problem was. But uh, now let's go back to, uh, to the directory and look and see, because I don't think it was a problem with the uh, writing. I just want to make sure. 10, climate data, fresh. And it, nope, that's that's in Fahrenheit. So so it works. This works right right here. So if, if the problem was that creating the new array, we fixed that. Yours didn't work. It didn't run. It's giving an error, or it didn't it didn't actually convert it. Even without examining. I've got an automatic If I try to delete the catalog, it's always got a lock. Okay, so maybe because it has a lock, it wasn't overwriting it. Yeah, sometimes RGS is like that, and I have to close everything down and open it back up, and it's it's annoying. Uh, and negative thousand. Negative thousand. Okay. Well, we'll look at uh, we'll look at that. Um, but for sure, that time where it wasn't when it wasn't running, that might have created a bunch of locks on it because uh, it, when it wasn't running all the way through. But now that it's running all the way through, it seems to be working fine. Um, okay. There's one more thing I'd like to show you before the break. Okay. And, and basically, uh, it is. Uh, it is the equivalent of doing a condition statement. So if you have some code that's going to run a condition statement uh, in RTIS, uh, particularly if there's a lot of them, sometimes it works faster. It runs faster to run the condition statement uh, outside of RTIS, and plus it doesn't require a license. Um, and oftentimes, even if you're not going to circumvent the license issue, there's the issue of, I'm doing, I'm already, I've already got the, the, I'm doing this process where I have an umpy array, I already have it, 
and I need to do a condition statement. Okay, so it's helpful to do to know how to do a condition uh, statement in uh, NumPy, and it's really easy. Okay, so this is the third example here, right? So it's this syntax right here, this NumPy dot where. So this is the same thing as a condition statement. And instead of instead of using this example, I'm just going to copy this NumPy array here. Uh, into our current example and call it example five. So this value right here, and I'm just gonna insert this right here and say file, save as example five. Oh, I didn't mean to run it. So I'm going to have to talk about it first. It'll run in the background. But what you're doing here is, actually, this is from the original array. So it doesn't even matter that I run this, because it's just, it's just, it's just creating this array here. It hasn't saved it out to a file yet, because uh, it's still using array 2. But the way that you read this is that this numby.where, this is like your condition statement. Anywhere where this array is greater than 75, you're going to do something, okay? And this is the like the value if true, and this is the value if false. Just like a condition, it's a lot like a condition statement. And so this value if true, you can put an array. You can even put in another where statement, okay? If you wanted to, you can nest them just like you can with the with a condition statement. So the way that you read this is, if the array is greater than 75, give it the value that's in array. If not, give it a value of zero. So we could we could basically use this to find those areas that are we could threshold it. Um, let's modify this statement so that we can find all those areas with a March temperature that's greater than seventy-five. So we could simply do something like this: one zero and and. Uh, Call this, uh, well, and we also have to change this to this. And then the out array has to be, so we have to, we have to feed the out array into this to get it. And we're basically going to take all of the values that were once uh, 75 and up and change them to 1, and all the values that were below 75 are going to have a 0. All right, and I'm going to call this uh, FT threshold. What's that? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. So on the out array, it's done by that where you put one in the middle, one comma zero there. One yes, I change it. Take out the array name. The ARR, yeah. So you can just feed a, 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 a scalar is what they call it, a one-dimensional number in there, and it'll it'll broadcast that through the entire array. If you gave it an array, it will, it will put that array value for the appropriate array value in there. It actually works almost exactly how ArcGIS would work. So you could change this, this right here to con, and this could be a raster. This could be greater than 75, and then you could give it another raster or a, um, a scalar value and then give it another scalar value. In fact, well, I'll run it once. I'm going to run this. And then I'm going to run it a second time where I leave a ray in there. So this will take a few seconds because it's doing, it's doing two operations uh, in the... Uh, it's a pretty fast. It didn't print. It didn't print it. So maybe that's why it went so fast. Let's see what it looks like. So now I'm going to refresh this and call, yeah. So there's a, thresh, there's a threshold. I'm not sure why these didn't show up as no data. Oh, because of the con statement, yeah. I mean, because of the where statement. So it even changed those values because they were negative 14 or whatever. It changed those also to no, to no data because it changed them to zero. But anyway, what do the green areas, they're green on my screen. They might be different color on your screen. 
What do those areas represent? Yes, over 75. So they're the areas that have a March temperature that's over 75 degrees. I mean, that's pretty warm for a March temperature average, even if it's the average high, daytime high. Uh, so it's just the peninsula, South Florida, and uh, the desert areas of Southern California. Because the coast, like if we zoomed in here, no, I don't, not that necessarily, but okay, let's, uh, let's switch over to this. See how the coast goes out there a little bit further. This is the coast. It's not, it's not, it doesn't have that warm of a temperature. That's where I grew up. In March, it's still kind of cool. It's not 75 for the daytime. Okay. All right. Uh, so, going back to the code here. I'm going to run this one more time, but I'm going to change this back to ARR. And I'll, I'll save this. I'll save as uh, example 6. Save. And I'm going to call this uh, temperature... Do we want ARR or ARR2? Oh, ARR2, thank you. Well, uh, ARR2 would give us the, the Celsius values, uh, which we were having a problem with before. Okay, so I'll let this run. See if it ran. There's my other one. So now what it's done is it's kept those those temperatures that were over 75, it kept them there. So that's the difference between the see how the, see how that, that's still over 75, there's still values there. So what we did was we said, if the value is over 75, keep it. If not, give it a value of zero. We could maybe change the no data value to zero. That might be, that might be more appropriate. So that we basically masked out anything that was under 75, but we kept the original values. I'm going to try running that like that. I might have to step off of it from here, see if I can do it in time. So, um, when we take, oh, it just restarted. So maybe, maybe it, it freaks out when we do that. Let's try to delete it and see if it gives us that error. No. Run. It didn't, it, see, it didn't get to done. So... Oh, I got to done that time. So I think that there's some issue with that it's hanging on to these, and sometimes it's just causing the program to crash rather than actually complete. Uh, okay, so if we look at uh, if we look at it now, we there's the entire thing. We basically turned everything to no data except for the, the values that uh, were. Uh, that we wanted to keep. And we didn't change them to one, we just kept them the same. All right. Um, I think we should take, yeah, go ahead. Do you have a question? Yeah, I'm going to go back to the code. Oh, do you have a question about it? Oh, so the no data went from 14.6 to 14.5. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, I just changed it to zero. Okay. No problem. All right. So um, there's a few different ways to do this. But on the break, uh, we'll do a 20-minute do break, five minutes longer than normal. So we'll come back at uh, 15 after uh, the hour. So on the break, what I want you guys, there's a little break assignment. And we'll, uh, we'll think about it. You don't have to type a code for it. But come up, be ready to make a few suggestions. What I want to be able to do is keep all the, all the non-USA data, the area outside. I want to keep that no data. But I don't, I, the stuff inside the United States, I want that to have a value of zero. So inside the United States, 
So this still needs to be zero, but I, I want to make I want to make that other data outside the US be called no data. So they can't both be no data. Like this one has them both be no data. I want three values. No data out here, zero in here. And then all these values need to stay the same, okay? So we need to come up with some code suggestions as to how we could do that. Something like pseudocode, like you could change something, some line of code in there. Uh, to do that. And if you want to actually do it uh, in your code, you can. I'm going to leave this up. Actually, it's not that cold. I'm going to leave that up and uh, I'm going to. Uh, I'll, I'll be back. All right. All right. And then we'll talk about the last one here. doing that. I might have to log in. Is the network the internet? That's the problem. Uh, Thank you.